Dear Lord, we do pray that you bless the preaching of thy word today. Thank you, God, for all you're doing in our lives. Open our eyes, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Title of this message is The New Masculinity, The APA's Assault on True Manhood. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. That is the point and conclusion. Notice a dream comes through the multitude of business. The book of Jude says in the last days that they're going to be filthy dreamers, defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. They despise government, church government, family government, civil government, and speak evil of leaders. Luke 21, 34, our Lord says, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Having a heart overcharged means that you are not aware. You're not aware of the Lord's coming. You're not aware of what's happening all around you. You're not discerning the times. Eating too much. Drunkenness. Cares of this life. Those are the things that keep us from sobriety. So we will end up, as Solomon says here, with this multitude of business, with these cares of this life, where we are not taking time with God. No regular time for church, Bible study, prayer, family devotions, thinking. It all leads to a life of delusion. It keeps you distracted. You become like a drunkard or a person who is dreaming in Wonderland, La La Land. Our Lord said in Luke 17 that as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. And we're not aware to the last minute the great destruction that was coming upon them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. I gave you these verses because I want you to see what is happening in the world today. What is happening in our country? What is happening in the APA is madness. It is a lack of sobriety. Isaiah 29 verse 7 says the multitude of all nations that fight against Ariel, that's Jerusalem, and that distress her shall be, listen, as a dream of a night vision. It shall be even as when a hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. This is a prophecy, uh, ultimately, of Armageddon. It's a prophecy of all the nations of the world coming against Jerusalem. And when the Lord comes in judgment, they're going to have an awakening. They'll be sober then. But until then, they have this fantasy. They're living in la-la land, in dreamland. In a secondary sense, this pictures... What is happening right now today as the nations go against the things of God, the true church of God, the remnant? Jeremiah 51 
says the nations have drunken of her wine, Babylon. Therefore, the nations are mad. The Bible predicts in the last days that people will be drunk, drunk on drugs, drunk on alcohol, but also drunk with the cares and pleasures of this world. So they don't have time to discern the time. But their fantasy world's going to fade quickly as God leaves them to the consequences of their sins and also when the Lord finally comes in judgment. Now, Isaiah is going to continue in verse 10, chapter 29. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Josiah the king, at age 20, began smashing the idols and the groves of Baal, the transgender god. At age 26, as he's restoring the house of God, they find an old copy of God's law. As it was read before Josiah, he repented even more. And he ended up with more zeal and tore down the houses of the Sodomites. And what you see here is a principle. When you respond to God's light, God sends you more. But what we see from Isaiah 29 verse 10 is that when you sell away the light that God has given you, when you reject light, God takes away even more light from you. He sends you strong delusion. There is a falling away from light, from truth. The Bible says that we are to exhort one another daily lest any of us be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You can become hardened. You can be turned over. In Romans chapter 1, it says that there is this downward progression of people or of a nation. Once they begin to reject God's knowledge, God's truth, God's ways, God turns them over to a reprobate mind and they become homosexuals eventually. They destroy themselves with those things that are against nature. So what you're seeing today, it's not reasonable, it's not sobriety, it's not natural, it's insanity. It is madness. It is actually a judgment upon the minds of people. This embracing of transgenderism, of androgyny, of sodomy, this last day's revival of paganism, of sodomite paganism, it's a judgment for rejecting God. It's a judgment for evolution. It's a judgment for not walking in the Lord's truth. Once Satan gets a hold of people and you've been turned over to Satan, he will shame you into becoming a pervert like an animal. Now notice in verse 16 of Isaiah 29, surely you're turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. This is what's happening today. The nations are turning everything upside down. And God is basically saying here, shall the pot say to the potter, I don't like how you made me right side up. I want to be upside down. Imagine an artist painting a girl on a canvas and the girl in the painting begins to say she wants to be a boy. Or imagine a boy who is being painted uh, says he wants to be a girl. Of course, that's insanity. But God says this is what it's like when a pot tells me it wants to be upside down, when it wants to go against the creator of the pot. God has ordained man to be a man and a woman to be a woman. He has ordained roles. He has ordained clothes. He has ordained a distinction. And what Satan wants to do is, of course, pervert everything. What God has separated, Satan wants to join together and mingle. With this background, you can now understand why the APA, the American Psychological Association, has recently painted traditional masculinity as a mental disorder. They have lost their mind. USA Today, January the 10th, says psychologists call traditional masculinity harmful 
face uproar from conservatives. Let's continue looking in Isaiah 29, verse 20 now. It says, the scorner is consumed. So ultimately, these people who scorn and mock God's word, who scorn his truth and his ways, who scorn what God says is natural and normal and right, these scorners are going to be consumed. They're in la-la land now. They're in a fantasy world, but they're going to wake up. They will be consumed and judged. And the nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. But it says these scorners, before they're judged, it says in verse 21, that make a man an offender for a word. Oh, that's happening today. And they lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate. You say the wrong word today, whatever that word might be, and you're fired. You lose everything. Hate crime, they'll get you for thoughts today. But notice, they lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate. They cannot stand preaching. They try to entrap preachers to see if they say the illegal word, whatever that may be. And notice it says these scorners turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Don't miss this now. They turn aside the just for a thing of naught. In other words, the just, that which is right and true. The righteous are replaced by the wicked, and the wicked are praised. So the traditional biblical masculine man, walking as God designed and ordained him to be, will be turned aside. And the thing of naught, the pervert, is received and praised. Well, here we have it. Micah chapter 3 verse 2 says they're going to hate the good and love the evil. Now, I'm pleased if there really is an uproar by conservatives. We've been trying to wake people up for over 20 years about this matter. Now it's here. The experts are now declaring that true masculinity is toxic. Now, listen to that again. Not just toxic masculinity. They're not just against toxic masculinity, which was bad enough, for we knew what they meant by the term. But now it is traditional masculinity. They say it is toxic. They've taken the mask off. God says the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. The prudent man foreseeth the evil so he can hide or prepare himself. Those who have called me crazy or extreme all these years for stressing traditional masculinity for boys and men and traditional femininity for girls and women must now witness that traditional manhood has been declared harmful and a mental disorder. And traditional femininity is, of course, scorned unless it is on a man. You can also go to Google News and type in restroom and arrest and behold what is occurring today as men enter women's restrooms and such like. What a world this is. It seems almost that overnight everything has manifested and all the things that were brewing for so long has reached a crescendo. It's very interesting because there was a time in the 1950s when these psychologists said that rebellious troubled teens were spawned by dominant mothers and passive fathers. That is, effeminate fathers who are bossed around by aggressive, loud, bossy wives. That is the reason for all of the teenage rebellion. This is what was taught in the 1950s. In other words, the psychologists at the time were saying, if you want to know where troubled kids are coming from, it's because you do not have men that are real men in the home. It is because the women are dominating the men in front of the children, and these loud, bossy wives, these mothers, are creating rebels. Thus, you will see films such as Rebel Without a Cause reflect this understanding while helping normalize rebellion. So they show a 
son talking to a father in a way that just was very unheard of at the time. But they have this form of godliness, and what they're saying is the whole reason for this teenage angst, that this whole reason for this rebellion is this confusion that is created by these sissy passive fathers and these dominant overbearing mothers. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Because they sure didn't stay there for long. That was a mask of sorts. Psychology was born in paganism, p- paganism and necromancy. And at the heart of paganism is, is androgyny, sodomy. Thus, psychology had to take the mask off and finally show its true colors and its true goals back to its roots. It's just a sophisticated pagan religion at its heart. And at its heart, pagan religion is Baphomet. Half goat, half woman, half man. A monstrosity. The Bible warns us not to be spoiled through vain philosophy. And that's what this psychology is. Now let's watch them take the mask off. In 1968, the DSM-2, the Psychological Manual of Disorders, listed homosexuality as a mental disorder. Interesting, 1968. Now, we know it's more than some mental disorder. Homosexuality is sin. If God sends somebody to hell for something, it's sin. It's not the same as having an ear infection. By the time you get to 1973, the APA downgraded homosexuality to sexual orientation disturbance. And by 1987, they removed it from the DSM-2. It was no longer seen as a disorder or a disturbance. I was saved not long after, began to serve the Lord fully. And not long after that, I began to preach. The World Health Organization removed homosexuality as a disorder in 1992. I hit the ground running. And we did everything that we could do by God's grace. I pray we could have done more. And I pray we will be able to do more to stand against this evil. I think the first book I ever wrote back then was called Biblical Manhood in an Effeminate Age. In the early 90s or or, or mid-90s, I stood against the new masculinity that I saw arising around me. And I knew this was a psychological masculinity. I realized that what was entering into churches and the promise keepers and such like, this was a new masculinity that was an imitation and a counterfeit of the true biblical masculinity and that somehow traditional biblical masculinity was being scorned. Now, it was not as open as the APA is now showing us this article, this paper that the APA has authored, has put out. They are openly embracing a new masculinity and declaring traditional masculinity as harmful. So we have done what we could do and have been trying over the years Many, many years standing against this. I have preached against feminism. We have preached against homosexuality. We have gone to the parades and tried to purify our cities and call our cities to repentance. We have launched the protestgayday.com to protest the gay days of the Texas Rangers and Six Flags and other uh, businesses. We did everything we possibly could have done. We should have done more. 
But I'm just trying to show you that we have tried to stand against this from the early days. I preach sermons about what a man is and what a woman should be. Some called it extreme. Some did not understand why the emphasis upon such things. At one time, homosexual newspapers listed me as one of the top three most hated preachers by homosexuals in the United States, which was fine with me. I'm trying to show that this has not taken me by surprise what this APA now has come out and stated. Many may be surprised now, but we've been warning about it. This whole idea of now... Boys going into girls' locker rooms in schools, businesses, all of this that's happening today with these transgenders entering in to the bathrooms of the opposite sex. It's shocking a lot of people, but a lot of people are still asleep. The APA now declaring traditional masculinity is harmful. It's shocking a lot of people. But this has been brewing. In my very first sermon, I tried to warn that psychology had become the religion of the last days. It's entrenched in courts and media and schools. It masquerades as science when it's really scientism. It has normalized homosexuality and it has crept into Christianity and has been feminizing men. But psychology was not finished. Traditional masculinity must ultimately and has now taken homosexuality's place in the DSM, so to speak. And remember, our verse says, the just is turned aside for the thing of naught. In other words, homosexuality now is perfumed and accepted and praised. But traditional masculinity, no, that's out. It is turned aside. Because they turn everything upside down. Welcome to the modern world of dreamland. Welcome to the world of delusion, the world of madness. The nations are mad. This was a long introduction, but I would like to now read some excerpts from the APA's guidelines for the psychological practice with boys and men. I wanted to share with you how we or why we are now in dreamland or much of the world is. This guideline states, although boys and men as a group tend to hold privilege and power based on gender, they also demonstrate disproportionate rates of receiving harsh disciplines, suspension and expulsion, academic challenges, mental health issues, suicide, physical health problems, public health concerns, and a wide variety of other quality of life issues. So let's see. Men are allegedly overprivileged in society today, yet they are suffering the most in almost every way. Now, does that make sense? They have a circular argument. They say that some are born homosexuals and that it damages them when people tell them that their choices are wrong. Yet these psychologists, along with almost all of society, including public school, the media, and Hollywood, have spent a generation demonizing boys and men for being masculine for having traits and feelings that are God-ordained and natural and are meant by God to be used for good. This is very upside down. So it's okay to demonize boys and men for being boys and men as they are created to be? But somehow or another it's wrong, it's dangerous and harmful to dare tell a homosexual, which is a lifestyle choice, that he or she is in sin. And even if somebody has a tendency toward a certain unnatural desire, does that mean you ought to follow it? 
Does, does God want you to follow every desire that you have? That's ridiculous. We do not believe that homosexuals were born homosexuals. Though I have preached and preached often that we are in a very dangerous age where you have BPA and antibiotics and hormones and so many endocrine disruptors and so many Christians absolutely naive or willfully blind about what they are doing to their children, what they're doing to their own lives, what they're doing to their own bodies. And I believe it is creating unnatural desires and tendencies and extra temptations on top of the flesh. It is feeding the flesh and making provision for it. But Paul wrestled with his body. He kept under his body. And things that are unnatural and wrong, we ought not make provision for the flesh, but we must resist that which is wicked and cast down vain imaginations. They go on and say there is a particular constellation of standards that have held sway over large segments of the population, including anti-femininity, achievement, eschewal of the appearance of weakness, Adventure, risk, and violence. These have been collectively referred to as traditional masculinity ideology. Now, as a side note, they list part of traditional masculinity is the eschewal of the appearance of weakness. Notice that word eschewal. Peter says that we ought to eschew evil. Don't ever let these liberals... And leftists, don't ever let them tell you that the KJV is archaic. They use the word eschew right here in their latest paper. Now, I would agree that biblical traditional masculinity is anti-feminine in one sense. It is anti-feminine as far as boys and men are concerned. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate in your King James Bible, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. The effeminate is something distinct, though related to sodomy, homosexuality. The effeminate are the cross-dressers, the role reversals, Effeminate are men that are feminized. So, yes, indeed, traditional masculinity is anti-feminine when it comes to boys and men. But they are not against femininity in girls and women. Biblical masculine men, biblical masculinity... Traditional masculinity is not against femininity in girls and women. It complements. We are for femininity in girls and women. Nor are we against the feminine moral virtues which all men and women should have. In other words, there are virtues that are for men and women, even though if they are even though if women may be stronger in certain virtues or certain virtues are more characteristic of their sex and other virtues might be more characteristic of men, but men and women are to walk in these universal virtues. Paul, for example, said he was gentle with one church as a nurse with her children. Likewise, women should have moral courage. In one sense, morally, women should quit themselves like men. I don't mean go join the military or the police force. But to quit yourself like a man means to overcome, to conquer, to stand up, to be strong. And I certainly believe that we need strong women today to stand up against all of this wicked, feminist, homosexual indoctrination. Women should be strong and manly enough to be feminine with a meek and quiet spirit. How's that for a paradox? 
The APA writers continue. Achievement, eschewal of the appearance of weakness, adventure, risk, and violence. It lists all these things as harmful, as if there's no good context for them. How about violence in regard to a man defending women and children? Using violence, if need be, in the right place. A gang of thugs breaking into a, a home, a classroom. So they try to say that there is no purpose for raising a tough, sacrificial boy to grow up and defend women and defend his country. If you want to see violence, take a look at what the feminists have done to millions of people through abortion. You want to see violence, look what's happening in the womb. They're trying to say traditional masculinity is violent. You ought to take a look at feminism. You want to see violence, look at how communism has joined with feminism and murdered millions and millions, and then in abortion has murdered millions and millions. This is unbelievable. These people are insane. They're lunatics. Achievement can also be positive. They say achievement is harmful. Achievement is part of masculine, traditional masculinity. I bet they're not against women being achievers. It sounds like somebody wants the hen house unguarded. Let's keep reading. They say it is critical to acknowledge that gender is a non-binary construct. Oh, no. So what they're saying now is there's not just male and female. No, when it comes to gender, there's all of these things in between, all of these choices. No, I'm sorry. There's male, female. In the beginning, God made them male and female. They go on to say boys with feminine identities or expressions may face especially negative reactions. Ah, now we're getting to one of their main points. What is the reason for all of this? The reason for all of this is so the indoctrination of homosexuality can continue. I don't know whether it's some worship of Baphomet or transgender Baal or whether it's population control. I, I don't know what. The, 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 I, I'm sure it's uh, all of the above to some degree. And some of them are just following the spirits that, that are in the air. But what's happening here is they're trying to make it where a father cannot or, or it will be declared a, a, a mental problem here, a harmful thing, if a father or a mother tries to talk a child out of these wicked, dangerous life choices of being a sodomite or transgender. They're trying to make it where you cannot say that this is wrong. They're making a man an offender for a word. They're saying traditional masculinity is dangerous to the homosexual. So now, you're not allowed to keep your child from being a crybaby or a sissy. You can't make your boy tough. You can't do what you can to make sure he's not a quitter in life. You shouldn't make him manly to endure hardness and stick with things, to keep his promises even to his own hurt. It's all about defending that which is queer. They go on to say research has demonstrated the more boys violate norms of masculinity, the more verbal and physical abuse they may face from peers. These experiences may lead to mental health problems, including depressive symptoms. Okay, now let me get this straight. The more boys violate norms of masculinity, the more they're going to face vi uh, verbal and physical abuse. So what is their conclusion? Let's just demonize normal masculinity. Let's just demonize God-created traditional biblical masculinity. That's the problem. Let's declare that the mental disorder. In that way, once 
Society is saturated with the idea that masculinity is evil, normal masculinity is evil, is wrong, is harmful. Then suddenly you'll have this wonderful la-la land utopia where everybody holds hands in a Coca-Cola commercial. I mean, it's ridiculous. This is insane. So to keep from verbally or physically abusing the homosexuals, they're going to demonize and verbally abuse men who have traditional masculine traits. Upside down. Turning aside the just for the thing of naught. They're not done. They go on and say psychologists also strive to reduce and counter the damaging effects of microaggressions. Oh, brother, microaggressions. So now we have micro aggression. So you need a safe place with teddy bears. By teaching boys and men from historically marginalized backgrounds skills to cope with racism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. What about all those words? And by working with families, schools, and communities to provide supportive environments for these populations. I tell you, psychology is the religion of the last days. Oh, it'll be mixed with Catholicism and theology and what's called Christianity today. It'll end up in just one big, giant, super church, uh, super religion. But I'm t And it's already entrenched in our society. Now, notice... They want to teach. They want to give you skills. They're trying to stop anybody from shaming sodomites or effeminate sissy boys on their way to becoming sodomites. So they not only want to keep you from shaming or reproving or in any way convicting a sodomite, they want to keep you from convicting or shaming a sissy or a crybaby on his way to becoming a sodomite. They do not want you in any way to hinder this indoctrination. The Bible says Jerusalem in the last days is as Sodom. The Lord says it's going to be as in the days of Lot, the whole world. They go on and say fathers and male caregivers may benefit from education about the psychology of masculinities, plural, including a range of masculine expression. Now, don't miss that. Masculinities, plural, a range of masculine expression. So here's what this is all about. Fathers, when the boy comes home and says, Dad, I am coming out of the closet and I now think I'm a girl, and I want to identify as a girl. What the man is supposed to say, if you're healthy in a psychological sense, according to these lunatics, you're supposed to say, oh, well, that's all right, son. You're still very masculine, because I have learned from the psychologist that masculinity is a very wide-ranging idea. And you're still very masculine, although you have a dress on. Researchers in the psychology of men and masculinity have identified that insecurities are linked to adherence to traditional masculinity ideology. Now, hold on. Roll your sleeves up right here. They are saying... The reason, the reason that men want to adhere to traditional masculinity is because you're insecure. The reason you are against homosexuality, they will say, is because you are insecure. The reason a preacher preaches against homosexuality, the reason he preaches for women to be feminine and men to be manly, the reason he preaches these different roles that God has ordained, the reason he wants women to dress as women and men to be manly uh, is because of insecurity. Here it is now. Here it is. They have it upside down again. Let me show you how this is upside down. The Bible says in Peter that women can be like the godly women in the Old Testament who submitted to their husbands if they don't get afraid with amazement. 
That means if they don't have a weak heart. God says the woman who is imperious or bossy has a weak heart. How weak is thy heart? Says Ezekiel 1630. The work of an imperious, whorish woman. Did you hear that? God, God in the holy word of God says an imperious woman, a bossy woman, a loud and stubborn woman, according to the Bible, is insecure. She has a weak heart. Peter says, now, if you trust God and don't fall apart, if you don't end up afraid with amazement, you won't be afraid to be a godly woman with a meek and quiet spirit like Sarah who called her husband Lord. In other words, according to the Bible, women who submit are women of faith, women of courage, strong women. They're able to be feminine. They're not insecure and nervous. They rest in God's order and they blossom in it. So I would wholeheartedly agree when they say insecurities are linked to adherence to traditional masculinity ideology, as long as you're talking about women. Insecure women are afraid to man up and be feminine. Insecure boys and men are afraid to take leadership and be bold and overcome. They've got it backwards. They're afraid to initiate. Insecure men are not manly. Insecure men are afraid to stick with things. They're afraid to take leadership. They're afraid to go against the grain. They're afraid to be different. They're afraid to stand up for God and for what they believe. But if you walk in faith and boldness in the Holy Spirit, you're not afraid to go against this culture. You're not afraid to be an antipath and go against this world. You're not afraid to be a godly woman and grow your hair long and wear long and flowing garments that women are supposed to wear. You're not afraid to be naturally beautiful and adorn yourself with modest apparel and to have a meek and quiet spirit. You understand that that's your strength and the soft tongue breaketh the bone. The current idea is that if men are secure, they'll be man enough to wear pink. I remember when that gay cowboy junk, that movie, invaded Fort Worth years ago. God forbid. We didn't go see that wicked thing. But some wicked cowboy movie about gay cowboys came out. And suddenly, uh, all of these Western stores uh, in the men's section began to basically sell women's blouses for men. They're supposed to be for cowboys. And I would walk into those Western stores and I would ask the clerk, where are the men's clothes? Where's the men's section? And they would say, well, that's the man's section. I said, so you're telling me a man's supposed to wear this, a cowboy? And some fellow would say that, well, real men are secure enough to wear it. And I'd walk over and say, well, here's a pretty bow. Why don't you stick that in your hair? Are you man enough to wear this? Let's see how secure you are. Why not get real secure? This is ridiculous. Absolutely absurd. They're perverting a classic truth that an insecure boy may boast or fight all the time. I remember back in elementary school, there was a little boy. I obviously wasn't a large kid. He was smaller than me. And it seemed like he would fight with somebody every single day. He may have had insecurities. Just as women in men's roles overcompensate and try to prove something. I was in the principal's office quite often in elementary school for fighting. But it's a fact. Any fight I had in elementary school was because the teachers would leave the class and boys would begin to mess with the girls until they yelled for them to stop. I was kind of a class leader in elementary school. And everybody would look at me, and I would wait, and I would wait, and I would try to ignore it. And finally, I'd slam my pencil down on the desk, and the whole class would begin to hoot. And this would happen quite often. 
And I would get up and I would give it all I had. One giant boy with a giant afro. He was a regular tormentor. And I would do everything I possibly could. Uh, he'd, he'd usually end up sitting on me. But at least I'd keep him occupied till the teacher got back. And then we'd both have to go to the principal's office. My point in all of this is this. And, and listen, I got better. I wasn't always sat on as I grow up. Uh, but, but listen to me. My point is, that was not insecurity. I didn't have anything to prove. I didn't want to stand up and do anything. I'd rather just do my math and do my work. But I'm not going to just sit back and let somebody mess with a girl right in front of me and nobody in the whole class will do anything about it. That was an insecurity for me. So I'm trying to show that when people stand up and they want to walk in a traditional masculine ideal, there's so much more going on. There are noble reasons for defending biblical masculinity. How about obedience to God? How about a love for the Bible? How about a willingness to stand up and get the job done? How about discernment and discerning the times? Some people who try to be manly in some kind of gangster perverted sense, some of them are perhaps insecure. What they need is masculine fathers, traditionally masculine fathers. What happened to the 1950s psychology that all these gangs and, and uh, disobedient delinquents came from boys who had sissy, weak fathers? What happened to that, APA? But now you celebrate your new masculinity. How strange. They go on and say, research has carefully detailed the role of masculinity in aggression, both verbal and physical, against those who do not conform to strict gender narratives, leading to violent and often fatal hate crimes against transgender and gender nonconforming people. Uh, now we see what this is all about. They're saying these traditional masculine men they can verbally or physically abuse those that do not conform to male or female in the classic sense. Well, let me tell you something. It's against nature. It's perverted. I don't care how you try to normalize it. It is against nature. And it's against God. And some men may indeed take matters into their own hands. They resort to a type of vigilanteism. It's like some in prisons who beat up or kill child rapists. See, I believe they ought to quit normalizing perversion and perverts. They ought to quit protecting the violence that these perverts do. And maybe more men will not resort to street justice. I'm not excusing their vigilanteism or street justice. But I have witnessed policemen turn a blind's eye at Christians being assaulted. We have videos of homosexuals assaulting Christians, coming up and trying to kiss them and do gross things and, and, and assaulting Christians. And YouTube was too ashamed, apparently, to allow this to expose their protected group. See, if you want to see violent people, just read what happened in Sodom and what that Sodomite crowd was really like. If these psychologists want to study verbal and physical violence, let them read hundreds and hundreds of emails we received over the years when we did protest gay day and such like, you have never seen such violent, wicked threats, such hatred. See, as long as they think they can get away with it, as long as these protective groups are never going to be held accountable by the media, they're going to continue. They're going to continue to act in outrageous, unlawful ways. 
No, no, the, 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 the verbal abuse and violence, you have the wrong group. You have the wrong group. You have the wrong group. Additionally, traditional masculinity ideology encourages men to adopt an approach that emphasizes promiscuity. Okay, now we have more madness. Traditional masculinity does not emphasize promiscuity. That came from their own psychological cesspool of men like Kinsey. It came from psychologists in the 1930s that said since they believe evolution is true, they started telling college kids that, listen, we've studied monkeys and, and, and we've watched monkeys, and, and since we're just a glorified monkey, you ought to live like a monkey. Promiscuity came from psychology. Or put it this way, they gave the so-called scientific justification for it. And now they're suddenly against the promiscuity that they inflamed? That's not biblical masculinity that's into promiscuity. How can giving into lust and that which is unlawful be manly? The Bible says many strong men have been slain by her. Meaning that the stronger you are, the less likely it would be that the adulteress would have sway over you. Many strong men, but the Bible says don't, don't make provision for the flesh. Don't go near the strange woman's house. You may think you're strong, but you might not be as strong as you think you are. See, I believe these people must be addicted to their own psych drugs to be so blind to the fact that they created the sexual revolution. And not only that, to be so blind to the promiscuity that's in homosexuality by its very nature, by its very definition. Go see. Even when they pretend to be married or pretend it's so sick to even talk about. But, but my point is, there is much promiscuity in homosexuality. It's insane to even have this discussion to even have to talk about such insanity so traditional masculine ideology emphasizes promiscuity that is so insane that is so insane they go on to say individuals who adhere to traditional masculine gender roles hold more negative attitudes toward transgender and gender non-conforming persons i mean they just can't get off of this thing Father involvement with infants and young children has been associated with advanced language development. Amen to that. Father involvement. A lower likelihood of cognitive deficits. Amen to that. For school-aged children, 4 to 12, father involvement has been associated with increased levels of academic achievement. Amen to that. Literacy development. Fewer internalizing behavior problems, higher levels of emotion regulation, and math and reading skills and social adjustments. For adolescents, father involvement has been associated with healthier eating patterns, less delinquency, fewer depressive symptoms, less violent behavior, better grades, and less substance abuse. Right. Amen to that. Finally, they're getting some sense here for a minute. So why don't they quit perverting what a father is and start getting out of the way? Why don't they quit breaking up families? Why don't they stand against this wicked, no-fault divorce? Why don't they quit t telling people to follow their feelings instead of doing what's right? Why are they... separating families with their wicked advice in court that are minimizing father's roles in the life of children. They have studies for everything they just said about how children blossom when they have their fathers and father involvement. 
So why are they against traditional masculinity? They go on to say childhood, physical, or sexual abuse victimization has been found to be a significant precursor to aggressive behavior in boys and men. Now listen to what they just said. They say when boys are sexually abused, it is a significant precursor to aggressive behavior. Now, who abused the boys? Was it not Catholic priests and such like who are homosexuals? Straight men were not abusing boys sexually. So let me ask a question. If this aggression comes, according to their own writing here, if a significant proportion of this so-called aggressive behavior comes from being sexually abused, who abused them? Homosexuals abuse them. Sodomite men. So if this is a significant precursor, then they need to attack the new masculinity. They need to attack sodomy. They need to say, we believe aggressive behavior in boys and men is coming from the fact that homosexuals got a hold of these children when they were young, these boys. Why are you attacking traditional straight masculinity? Why are you attacking biblical masculinity? A priest in a gown who's celibate enshrining and walking in a Christianized version of paganism is obviously still walking in the pagan Greek idea of masculinity, which is just pure pagan androgyny. No wonder the Catholic priests are having so much trouble. Their whole system is built upon a pagan basis. It's why psychology and Catholicism are linking together and why a new Christianity, which is just really at the heart of, Paganism. It's the worship of Baal in the name of God. Why are they attacking traditional biblical masculinity? If a significant portion, if, if a significant precursor to aggressive behavior in boys and men is being sexually abused by a homosexual, these people have lost their minds. But they're not done. They say other risk factors for aggressive behavior include poor parental and teacher supervision and frequent viewing of violent media and living in high crime neighborhoods. Okay, that's right. We agree. Aggressive behavior is coming because some pervert in the new masculinity sodomite got a hold of some boy. At least that's what they're saying. I'm not saying that a boy that's been abused has to be aggressive. I'm just saying it's, it's no wonder that the poor thing is going to have trouble. But now they're, set, they're telling us that other risk factors are poor parental and teacher supervision. Well, if you want to fix that, quit breaking up homes then. When people come to marriage counseling, quit telling them, well, y'all obviously uh, are not fit. And so, uh, you know, obviously you need to leave this man. Quit breaking up homes. What God has put asunder, let not man, uh, uh, join together, let not man divide asunder. Quit breaking up homes. Get rid of no fault divorce. So there can be a father in the home. How many children have we heard grow up and say? How many men have we heard say, I was afraid to do bad when I was young because of my father? There's something about a father, which is why fathers need to get with the program. Sometimes they're being hindered by, by courts and such like. By women that leave and have affairs. And tear up their homes. But sometimes men are out breaking up their homes. 
Sometimes men are passive, distracted. Even the psychologists are saying what amazing results you have by an active father in the home who's watching with proper supervision. And then they go on to say, frequent viewing of violent media. Now they're sounding like the fundamentalists. That's right. We've been preaching against this wicked watching of violence, watching people be tortured, the blood and the gore. It's right back to the circus of Rome. And notice, living in high-crime neighborhoods. How do they get in a high-crime neighborhood nine times out of ten? Because mama left daddy because she's having an affair on the Internet or something. And then she moves away. And what happens? They end up in a neighborhood that's high-crime. That's a major way these children end up in these neighborhoods. They go on to say physical assaults from female partners have shown to create myriad psychological problems for men. The domestic violence system has historically focused on helping battered women. Okay, that's right. Hey, let me tell you something. If you do end up up uh, with this new masculinity invading everywhere, you're going to start finding out that th these men will no longer be ashamed and embarrassed to call up the police and say, hey, I've just been attacked. You'll find out what's really going on in some homes with the verbal abuse and physical abuse. There's some wicked men out there physically and verbally abusing women, but I'm going to tell you there's a whole lot of women verbally and going crazy and acting insane in, in homes across America. So they need to quit attacking natural masculinity. Maybe they should start with abusive mothers who bully their boys because they have this hatred of masculinity, revenging, taking it out on their sons. Now, in conclusion, we need to ask, do you trust these people? to dictate to you what healthy masculinity is. And one of the biggest problems is not traditional masculinity, which nurtured boys by challenging them to cowboy up. One of the biggest problems today is the psychological and psychiatric addiction to putting boys on sedatives just for being boys. So they never develop and learn self-control. That's the abuse. If you want to see child abuse, if you want to see what's happening to children, it is not traditional masculinity that's hurting these children. It's psychologists putting them on dope so the caterpillar will never become a butterfly. Now in closing, let me say this. Biblical masculinity is not an arbitrary lording. It doesn't mean being a lord in the sense of uh, a tyrant. But I'm not one of those that's going to neutralize everything God said about a man being the leader in his home. Some men just get up here and use the pulpit to neutralize everything God said. So by the time they get done with that sermon, there's no way that man can go home and say anything or do anything in that home because the woman's going to say, well, you're just not loving me. If you love me like Christ loved the church, you wouldn't command that we get rid of these wicked movies. You wouldn't command that the, the, the son... Uh, has to take his earring out. There's another problem, and it's a matter of discussion. How greatly the definition of what lording or, or being tyrannical really is, how that has changed in our culture.
I don't recommend you do it. I'm not a fan of television. But just going back a few decades, just a few decades, the way men and women were presented in television and film was so different. It's a culture shock to see how women would disagree but keep their femininity while doing so. That's a lost art. That is a lost art. To see how daughters would speak to fathers and wives would speak to husbands. I don't mean everything that was on the TV or in the movies back then, but a large part of it. A large part of it. As late as the mid-70s, you will see women with a softness and a femininity that you will hardly ever see today. But it was also different in the way men were portrayed and what was considered acceptable. <laughs> the, the, television is not our Christian standard. But it does give you at least some idea of a cultural shift, so to speak. From grumpy Fred Flintstone to George Jefferson, to Ricky Ricardo and Lucy, to old grumpy Ben Cartwright throwing a fit. These were never Christian role models, but they reflect, they reflect that a lot has changed in our own culture that has placed new expectations upon men to be much, much softer. And women to be louder and harder. So much so that you could hardly even watch a so-called Christian movie today. You get five minutes into a so-called Christian movie and all of a sudden here comes a wife and she begins to yell out and scold and, and say they want to present that new femininity, that new feminism. They want to present that strong woman. And the man is all passive and... Many, many years ago at a large Christian gathering, I interviewed every elderly married man I could find. I'm talking folks up in the 70s and 80s. I asked them to tell me the one thing they would change if they could go back to earlier years. Now what the women said by and large was we stayed married because that's just what you did. You didn't break your covenant. Number one, it wasn't even legal and it wasn't acceptable. Uh, uh, you just didn't divorce. So we worked through our problems. We got through our problems. Divorce wasn't an option. But all of these men that I interviewed, one answer stood out over and over again. It was very shocking. I said, what would you do different if you could go back? And as elderly men do, they sit there for a moment and they begin to think and they say, let me tell you something. Here's what I would do. I would not correct my wife in front of the children. From that day forward, I felt it would be wise to follow that advice. Not that there are no exceptions, but I believe it's a part of honoring the wife. It would be like having an older daughter or son in the home. And there comes a time when you do not correct them in front of the other children in the same way that you might have when they were younger. It's part of honoring their maturity. And I'm not saying there's no exception to this. Now, I say all this to say, as we defend traditional masculinity, which I believe we ought to stand for biblical masculinity, we're not up here. I'm not up here telling men to go home and be tyrannical. Controlling yourself is a part of biblical masculinity. But I also don't believe that all anger is sinful. 
Now, if it is true, and I believe it is, to a large degree, that a man should not correct and scold his wife in front of children, how damaging to children is it to therefore see a wife scolding the husband? To hear her scorning him behind his back? Think about this now. If it's wrong for a man to reprove his wife in front of the children, how wrong is it? How against nature, how against God's order is it for a wife to scold her husband? Well, you better think about that. Because there are some children being harmed by some anger, by some chaos in the homes. And these 1950s psychologists, they made that their major point. Teenage rebellion, delinquency is coming from sissy papas and these bossy, out-of-control mothers who are dominating in the home, and they're loud, they're stubborn. Wow. Well, in this message, what we've tried to do is point out the reason that we have stood, the reason decades ago I wrote Biblical manhood in an effeminate age. The reason that we have preached messages and stressed the proper roles of husbands, of wives, of men, of women. It's not insecurity. A quote attributed to Luther says, Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be steady on all battle field besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point, meaning you better find out what the devil's doing. You better find out what the devil is attacking. And as you find out what the devil is attacking, you better stand against that. You better stand against that. If you can't see now what the devil has been attacking, we saw it way back then. But they have now declared traditional masculinity harmful. I hope you can see now, with all this transgender stuff, this is at the core and heart of paganism. God made male and female. He made man. That was His highest creation. Of course, Lucifer the serpent is going to pervert God's highest creation. It's a way of hating God. No, it's not insecurity. It's called discernment. It's called discernment. Discerning the times. And I'd also say it's in my genes. I have a Faust book here, a history of my family, of my lineage, and it says, the Faust men, none of them have become hairdressers and none of the women mechanics. So I believe it's in the Bible. And I believe that's enough. I believe we ought to be discerning. And we ought to realize what the devil is doing. And God says we need to get in the way of it. You need to stand against it. You need to be an Enoch. Dear Holy Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you will help these young people. Help all who listen to this sermon to understand what the devil is doing. And I pray women will dress as women and will strive to be more feminine and be what you created them to be. And dear God, I do pray that men will stand up and walk in their leadership role. And they will stand up, Father, and lead in a godly fashion and supervise and be involved in their children's lives, their families' lives, and say, for me and my house, we're going to serve God. 
I do pray you will help them, Lord. Help them understand. Help women understand the importance of being feminine and men the importance of being manly and masculine. And as all the world turns against male and female in the proper place, let us stand against the world. Let us stand against the world. Help these young people to see what this is all about, to understand, so they can be everything that you want them to be. And God, you called us to contend for the faith once delivered. To contend, Lord. Those are fighting words. Help us, Lord. Help these young people to be part of that Josiah revolution that stands up like Hulda and Josiah that stand up, Father. And though we don't want them taking a sledgehammer to the homes of Sodomites, Lord, but they can, they, they can stand up and take a hammer to this wicked culture. They can rebuke and reprove with all long-suffering and doctrine in the right place and the right way, God. And I do pray that you help them. I pray we'll have godly women that acquit themselves like men and stand against this feminism. And I do pray that you'll help some boys stand up, be gentle when they should, be kind when they should. But Lord, let them be warriors. Let them stand up and quit allowing the devil to seduce and indoctrinate. Lord, rebuke this wicked APA, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name, amen.